It's good to be here this morning. And my name is Keith Hamilton. This is my son, Keith, in the front. So um, we're missionaries in Ireland. We've been in Limerick uh, for almost nine years now. And the Lord, uh, Lord's been blessing there. And I appreciate you folks and your faithfulness. I appreciate Pastor Ludka and allowing us to, to come. And it's amazing to see what the Lord's done here in, in Connecticut. And uh, when I first came, when we first came, and it, and it just, it doesn't seem like that long ago, really. Um, we were, there, they were in a little strip, or you guys were in a little strip mall and just up the road. And, um, and then to come, and, and, and I, I was just watching online. I, was, I remember when, when you first broke ground, had the property, and, and, and to come and see what the Lord has done here is just amazing. And I appreciate you folks and your faithfulness to us over the years. And thank you for the food hamper, the room at, uh, at, the, Navy, at the Navy Lodge, and uh, beautiful, wonderful bed. I didn't even want to get up this morning. <laughs> it was so comfortable. Um, and then the, the delicious meal last night, uh, Brother Keith made, and, 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 and I appreciate looking out for Keith has our, our older son, Keith, or our, sorry, our son Keith, um, not the guy that cooked dinner last night, but um, <laughs> our son Keith, he, um, he has food allergies, he's allergic to nuts, and, um, and everyone's been looking out for that and, and being mindful of that, and I appreciate that. And, uh, and also thank you for the delicious meal, and, the, the, uh, and I appreciate the, um, the gauges. We need more church planters in, in, uh, in America. Uh, a lot of Bible college students, they graduate, and they want to take a church. They want a salary, um, but he's, you know, going and, and planting a church in New England. Most people, a lot of people don't want to go to New England and start a church, but I appreciate him yielding to the Lord's calling and uh, in doing that and coming up here. And Massachusetts, of all places, that is not an easy place. <laughs> that is not an easy field. And, um, but, it, but, you know, when God calls you to do something, uh, he equips you and he calls you and he brings people across your path that are, that are hungry for the gospel, that are looking uh, for God. And, um, and I know he'll bless that ministry. And, and I'm, I'm glad that he's, he's doing that. And we need more, more people like that. Now, Ireland... Ireland's a little different, um, and you can ask me more questions after. Uh, one of the differences uh, with Ireland, um, when, you, when you set a time to meet somebody, um, one of the cultural differences, uh, when you set a time to meet somebody, um, you expect them to, be, um, at, to, to meet you after that certain time, not before. Um, on our video, the man... I didn't have uh, different reasons. I didn't. I, I only had my son uh, getting baptized. Um, there was another man that was that got baptized, uh, but he showed up 30 minutes after the service. Uh, but he had all his things with him, and I just, I, you know, I wasn't going to tell him no. You can't get baptized. Um, he'd been begging me for months, and and I told him a week before. I said, I said, please be on time. I said it's your it's your baptism, but he, you know, he showed up 20 minutes late. So. Um, but that's very common, very common over there. One of the missionaries told me when I came over that when I first got over to Ireland um, that it's a, it's a first world country with a third world mentality. That's very true that a lot of things that they do are, are, are what you would expect in a third world country. Uh, the people are very friendly, um, but when you, when you witness to them, you have to be mindful of the fact that when you talk to them, um, they believe, they already think they're, they already believe themselves to be Christians. Um, they believe everything that they practice in the Catholic Church is in the Bible um, because they've never been shown. They don't know anything about it. So it's a, very, it's a big eye-opener when you show them in the Bible verses that completely contradict um, any other teachings. Um, like uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, and verses like that, I showed one man, I said, I said, I said, a lot of people think that the Catholic Church has changed the Bible over the years. I said, look at, I said, I said, Do you, don't you think they would have changed this verse? And I showed it to him, and it was a verse that said, uh, Bishop is to be the husband of one wife. <laughs> and, um, and he looked at me and he said, yeah, you're, you're right. They would, <laughs> they would have changed that. Um, so they're, they're, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing to see somebody, you know, you, you, you give them a Bible and you sit down and they fumble through it and they don't know where the verses are and realizing that that's the very first time they've ever opened a Bible and you get to teach them and it's, it's just, it's so rewarding and I really appreciate it and I, I love being, I love being over there. Um, I love the, I love the work over there. I'm excited to get back. I really didn't want to, um, 
Well, one of the reasons we didn't come back earlier is because I didn't want to come back earlier. I, love, I, I enjoy, I, I like the people. It's, it's difficult, it's a lot of work. You have to help the people. When they, even when they get saved, you have to help them swim upstream because uh, the culture goes, goes a different way. Um, and and, and they, 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 face a lot of, they, they face a lot of persecution. People will turn on them. And, um, and, but it's, it's, it's rewarding, and I, I really I enjoy it. Uh, they were nervous about me coming back, um, uh, that I would stay. I think part of it is because if they could come to America, they would stay. Um, and then the other part of it um, is because a lot of people from America have come there, tried to start a church, or got a little group started and then left. So uh, we're not going to do that. We were able to buy a house uh, this, uh, just this last year. Um, the Lord enabled us to be able to buy a purchase a home, and we have citizenship. So that, that helps the people. That gives them more security that we're going to be back. I'm not just coming back to the States and saying I'm going to be back in four months and, and with no intention of returning. Um, but let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, 3, verse 5. And here, um, in 1 Corinthians, we have the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking to the Corinthians about a problem that they're having um, in their church. And the problem is that um, they are arguing with each other over who uh, led them to Christ, who discipled them. And one group said, well, I'm of Apollos, and another group said, well, I'm of Paul. And there was an argument among them. What's that have to do with missions? I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> but here in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 5, Paul makes a statement. And I apologize. I would get through my My pastor gave me a new Bible. It's a um, classic note Bible, so I'm not used to where the pages are. And then I have blanks in between, so... Uh, bear with me, I apologize. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 3, 5, it says, um, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. When my family and I first got to Ireland, um, we found out quickly that there was no Walmart. They didn't have a Walmart there. You couldn't go to the local Walmart. But they had this one shop that was called Tesco. It's based out of uh, England. And it's kind of, it's similar to Walmart. It would be like if you have a Walmart, they don't call them super centers anymore, I notice. Uh, but when you, when you go to a Walmart, you know, it, it would, a Tesco would probably be about an eighth of the size, uh, but they have clothes and they have uh, kitchenware and they have televisions and, and, and school supplies and, 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 and a lot of variety that you would find at Walmart, just not the abundance. They also have groceries and things. Um, and, um, and in that, that shop, it's smaller, but Tesco, uh, they have a reward program. And in the reward program, you, when you join the reward program, um, you have, you, they give you a little card. When you spend money there, they give you points. And then you can take those points um, and you can, you can redeem them. You can get dinner at a restaurant. You can go to vacation places, zoos, uh, bouncy places, bouncy castles. Um, you can even book a holiday to go off somewhere and you can get a, they have these places, they're called holiday homes, where you get a, you get, you, you rent it for uh, three days or a week and, um, and it's, it's a whole house for you and your family with a kitchen and, and, and bedding and everything. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, uh, it's, it's efficient, it's, it's cheaper than, uh, for a whole family, it's cheaper than a hotel actually, um, per day. Um, but you can use the rewards for those different things. But this morning, um, God has his own rewards program, and it's based on what we do for him. It's based on what we, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's based on what we do for him, what, what, we're, what we're doing, whether it's giving to missions or, or teaching a Sunday school class or preaching or giving out a gospel track. And I title my sermon this morning, The Eternal Rewards Program. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for... Uh, thank you for your love. Thank you, Father, for 
Um, you, you saved us and you, you, you give us eternal life. Your son died on the cross for our sins. And that, that ought to be enough for us. But in your grace, um, you've given us, you also are willing to give us rewards for the things that we do for you. And I ask, Father, that you would help us, help us to get an understanding. And, 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 and Lord, I, I, uh, I pray, Father, that you would help us to, to seek those rewards uh, by doing things and, and by doing things for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul, as I said, Paul was dealing with an argument among the Corinthian people, and he explains that he and Apollos, they're only vessels, they're only workers for the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, it says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then he, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So first I want you to see that Paul is mentioning a work that's being done. And that work that was being done between him and Apollos, it was the work of spreading the gospel. In Mark 16 verse 15, Jesus told his disciples, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So there's a work that, that, that needs to be done. And today, we have a world in need of the gospel. Um, in Limerick, when I, we, I was having trouble, um, when I first got there, I would knock on doors and I would talk to people. I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting people to church. No, I don't want it. And they'd close the door. Um, they, would, uh, they don't say, no, in, I don't know if they say, in New Hampshire, they say, oh, I'm all set. Um, in, 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 in Ireland, um, they say, I'm grand, that's what they tell you, and then they close the door. Same, same thing, different, <laughs> different words. Um, but um, I developed this survey, and what I'll do is I'll go, I'll go to the doors with a survey. It's, it's, it's on a, um, I have a, a clipboard and a pen, and I'll knock on the door, and I'll, I'll tell them, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, my name's Keith Hamilton. I'm, I'm from uh, Oncaric Baptist Church. And we have a survey. I have a religion survey. I'm just getting to understand what people believe in the area and uh, trying to help people out. It, would you have a moment? To just It's just 10 questions. And although people may not listen to me when I, uh, when I talk to them about church, they're willing to take a survey and help me out. So I'll go through, and I, and I start asking them questions. And as I'm going through and, and, and getting to know um, what they think about church, what they're, what they're, uh, a lot of times they, they start talking to me and pouring out all these different things that happen to them and beliefs and, and stuff that's going on. They'll start asking me questions, and it gives me an opportunity to get the gospel to them at the end. And one man I, I, got, one man I was doing the survey with, he was a Catholic man, about 35 and I got through the whole thing, and, and he said to me, he said, he said, so you're telling me that I don't, I don't have to keep any of the sacraments, and I can go to heaven by simply believing on Jesus. And he got it right there. Now, he didn't get saved, but he got it. And that was the first time, he, he, that was the first time he had ever even heard the gospel clearly. And there are many, many, many people in the area, you know, after 35 years, myself, I had never, now I, no one, I, I grew up in a Methodist church in New Hampshire, and, um, but I'd been exposed to the term born again. They, they had it, they haven't. Um, and when I was growing up, we would travel into the South, and they would have, bill, people would have, had people paid to have billboards put up that said, had Bible verses that said, you must be born again, you must be saved, enter the kingdom of heaven. And so those, those, those things familiarized myself with that Bible term. And so when somebody, when I was 19, presented it to me, presented the gospel, I was familiar with being born again, but I didn't realize it was in the Bible. I didn't realize Jesus had actually said it. And when I was 19 years old, uh, after three, four months of a lady talking to me at my job, I finally received Christ as my Savior, and here I am today uh, going to, or in the mission field now. Um, but John, John 4, verse 35, it says, Say ye not, there are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He also said in Matthew 13, verse 38, the field is the world. And today, there are over six billion people in the whole world, including this area, including the United States, including the whole world, Ireland, Europe, Africa, 
and, and people who have never heard the pure gospel. They know about, they, they've heard stories about Jesus, but they've never heard about that he died, was buried, and rose again to save them from hell. So there's a work that needs to be done. I want you to understand that. And Paul's saying that, that there's a work that, there's a work that was being done, and he was referring to it. Second, the Bible says, I, I want you to realize that we're the ones responsible. Paul said in verse, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I have planted, Apollos watered. So the Apostle Paul was saying, Apollos and I are both doing the work. He said, I planted, and Apollos did the watering. We both are working in the field. We're both responsible. We're both doing a work for God. And, and, and when you think of sowing, when, when you think of a farmer sowing a seed in watering, it's pretty simple. It's not a difficult thing. Um, it's not something that requires a lot of skill or a lot of training. Uh, uh, my, my children do it. They'll take, they'll take a seed, my wife gets some dirt, and they stick the seed in the soil and a plant grows. Um, it's not hard. Uh, yet, but God needs people who are going to plant and going to water. Imagine this morning. Imagine if you had to hang a picture up and you tried, and you didn't have a hammer. You had a nail, you had the picture, you have the wall, but you don't have a hammer. What are you going to do? Do you put the nail up to the wall and start hitting it with your hand? <laughs> what do you do? Imagine a farmer. You saw him in his field. He didn't have a plow. And you saw him out there with a pencil. And he was taking that pencil and drawing it through the dirt and going up and down, all the way up, down, up and down his field, just, just the whole, you know, miles up, miles back, and, and just go with a little pencil. Imagine somebody hunting without a gun. They have a hand, they have a pocket, they, they, they have the bullets, they have the camo, they have the, they have a, maybe they even have a scope in their hands, but they have no gun. They go out into the woods and they see a deer and they, they, they creep up real quiet and they take those bullets and they start throwing bullets at them. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Imagine a woman trying to bake a, uh, baking a cake. She has no oven, but she has a grill. And she takes that cake, she, she mixes everything up, she has all the ingredients, and she puts it into the grill, she turns it on. Is that going to make a good cake? No, 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 not at all. And each of those scenarios are completely useless. But the same, we're God's tools. We're instruments that God uses to get the gospel out. When you, you, when you, when you hang a picture, you want a hammer. When you plow a field, you want a plow. When you hunt, you want a gun. And when you bake a cake, you want an oven because each of those jobs requires a specially designed tool. But just the same, God has designed each and every one of us for a special purpose. You, this morning, you're sitting in the seat, you are a designed tool specifically by God. There's no, there's no two people in here that are exactly the same because God's designed you so individually, so, so uh, as such an individual, right down to your fingerprints, and he's given each and every one of us special gifts. There are some things, I, I, I'm not, you wouldn't want me to come up here and sing you a special. <laughs> But there are some things that I can do. I, I, can, I, I, I know a little bit about video. I know a little bit about websites and things like that. And other people don't. But God can use, God can use these different things. God uses, we all have different personalities. We all have different preferences, likes, dislikes. And there are people that you can reach that your pastor cannot. There are people this morning that you come in contact with that your pastor will never, ever in his whole life come in contact with. He might meet them at the shop. He might rub shoulders with them, but he won't meet them or come in contact with them. And there are people that you can relate to from your past experiences, from your interests, from the things that God has put into you, your own personality, that other people cannot reach. And God wants to use you in his ultimate work to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. And there is no member of this church who is not important to God. 
God wants to use each of you. God has given you and he has put in you um, a specific characteristics for him and for his glory. We all have different gifts, but we have the same message. We have the same Bible. Some people want to change the message. They want to take hell out. They want to, they want to take sin out. God doesn't want us to change the mes- message, but he wants to use you. He wants to use your talents, your abilities to help soften the world and to spread the gospel to a lost and dying world. Romans 12, verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And our talents, they're not a question of rivalry. We shouldn't be thinking, you know, well, I sing better than you or that person sings better than me. There shouldn't be rivalry between us. We ought to praise God. If somebody gets up and sings a special, praise the Lord. You know, they're, they're, they're using their talent. They're using their God-given ability to, for, for God. They could be out in the world using it, but they're using it for God. And God has given us all, you know, it's not about it, all different abilities. It's not about being a better singer, better piano player, more outgoing. We all have different gifts and talents and abilities. You know, unfortunately, there are very few people uh, who are willing to work or willing to labor for the Lord. It, it said, one, I remember her, I, I heard it said one time that in a church, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Now, I don't know if, that's, if it's like that here. I've seen a lot of people working and doing different things and, and helping out. And, and you can see, you know, just the decorations and everything that, that there's a lot of people here that work together. But if, if that's true, if 10% of the people are doing 90% of the work, imagine what a church could do if they could increase that to 20%. That'd be twice as much work. Or imagine 50 or 90%. Matthew 9, verse 36 says, he says, Then said he unto his disciples, Truly, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So there's a work that needs to be done. We're responsible. And third, God is the one responsible for the results. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3 7, it says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So then he that planteth anything, oh, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So, um, oh, I read that twice, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, so a farmer, you know, a farmer can do all the work. He can prepare the ground, he can buy the seeds, he waters the plants, but he doesn't have control over the results. Um, he, can, he, can, he can't make the plants grow. He, he, he can't dig into the ground and, and stick a needle into the seed and force it to come out. That doesn't happen. All the, all the farmer can do, he can just do the work ahead of time. He buys the seeds and do all those things. But it, it, and in the end, it's God's job. And when we do the work, when, we, when the gospel is sown into the hearts of man... It is God that causes the increase. You know, sometimes people like to take the credit for salvations, but it's not us, it's God. And it's the working of the Holy Spirit, er, working of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. There are techniques we can learn to help, apologetics, learning answers to different questions, but ultimately the, our, our, it's not our counter-arguments. It's the gospel that saves a man. First Peter uh, 1 verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in verse 25, it says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So the word of God, the gospel through the word of God. Um, an unbeliever once asked a Christian, how does blood, how does blood cleanse? How can, how can blood cleanse your sins? And the Christian said, well, how does water quench thirst? And the, the unbeliever, he said, well, I don't know, but it does. And the Christian said, likewise, I don't know. And this morning, I don't know how the blood of Christ cleanses sin, but I know it does. And we don't know how the planting and the watering of the gospel seed results in people being born again, but we know it does, and it's God that gives the increase. Number four, um, last, we're going to be rewarded for the work not the results. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I prayed and prayed and prayed for this person to get saved and, um, and nothing's happened yet. Well, it's not for us to make the results. It's for God. It says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. 
And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We ought, to be, you know, we ought to be willing to work for nothing because of the incredible sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross to purchase our souls. The, 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 the whipping and the scourging. I have a, uh, the Ameri there was a doctor in the American Medical Association back in the 80s, and you can find it online if you search for it, but he did a whole, um, he did a whole, um, uh, he did a whole article on the, on the crucifixion of Christ, and it, it's just, just horrific when you read through it. Uh, he took um, history of, of Roman tortures. He took um, the accounts in the Gospels, other accounts, and he, he just kind of tried to compile it all together and, and figure out exactly how the crucifixion went. And it was just, just a horrendous thing to, to read through and to, and to see the pictures and just the medical uh, from, from a medical point of view, what, he, what Jesus went through when he was on the cross. Um, but, but even though the suffering and the payment of Christ was so great, God still has the grace to give us an incentive. And he tells us that there are rewards in heaven for our labors, and he's going to reward us for the work that we do here on earth. And when we do work, when we do things for God, we're laying up treasure in heaven. Um, in, you know, in, in some areas require more work, but God rewards us for the labor, not the results. When you think, when I think of New England, um, the, you know, you could go to, you could go to the Philippines and see a lot of people get saved. It might take less work. You could come to New England and see fewer people be saved in, in, a, in a church not as big. Um, but it, it, it require, and it requires more work, but God doesn't, God's not looking at the results. He's looking at the work and there's an incredible work. There's an important work that needs to go on. Uh, you know, I thank God for my pastor that went up to New Hampshire and started a church there out of nothing. I, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, but because of that man, because he did that, because he went up to New England and did that, because your pastor's here, started a church, because um, Brother Gage is going uh, to New England, there's going to be people in that area that have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And God's working through men, God's working through men coming up to New England to spread the gospel. If our successes in, in the eyes of God was based on the fruit, on the results, then Jeremiah was a failure. Uh, Livingston, who spent 20 years in Africa and saw one convert, was a failure. But we need to concentrate on the work, not on the results. Um, it's not us that brings the fruit, it's God. One of the best sermons I ever heard was a pa by a pastor was called Soul Warning. We're merely warning the sinner. Uh, we don't bring the increase. And when a, but, you know, when a farmer plants a garden, he can do the work, watering, planting, tilling the ground, but it's God that gives the increase. But Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 38, the field is the world. So the, the world, it's Groton, Connecticut. The world is New England. The world is America. The world is Europe, Africa, Asia, South America. And Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And when you tell someone the gospel, that is the work. When you hand somebody, when you take, uh, when you take one of these, that's good timing. So when you, take one of the, when you take one of the gospel tracts from the church and you give it to somebody, that's the work. When you leave a good tip with a track, hopefully you leave a good tip. Um, if you don't leave a good tip, don't leave a track. That's, that's my policy. I don't leave one. So I, I, I'm under conviction about leaving a track, so I always leave a good tip. Um, but when you, when you teach a Sunday school class and you're teaching these young people, you're doing a work for God. Um, when, you, when you bring people to church in your car, when you, when you help out a needy family in the name of the Lord, when you sing in church and you encourage saints to go on, and, 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 and it's so refreshing, you know, when you sit down and you hear a good song sung, and it was, it was great to see these young people all up here, all, all dressed up, and, 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 and that's doing a work for God. When you clean the church, when you decorate, when you design a church website, when you make a Facebook page, um, you, you're, doing some, you're doing a work for God, you know, and it's amazing. Today, you can just go up, you can make a Facebook page, you can make your own, every single person in here could make their own Facebook page and get the gospel to people on Facebook. It's amazing. You know, there's all kinds of other people doing it. Why don't we, we should do it as well. If, if you have the ability, if you can do it, you know, making up a Facebook page just for the Lord. It's a, I, I've, I, I've been amazed. I met several Irish people who got saved watching YouTube videos because somebody realized 
here's this media, I can get it out to the world, and they made a video and somebody watched it and received Christ as their savior in a foreign country. And they just kind of, they were just, they just, they just kind of float around Limerick looking for a church. When you leave America and you go to a foreign land to be a missionary, you're doing the work. Um, you're laying up treasures in heaven. You're investing time, money, and the things that God has given you toward the work of the Lord. When you give to missions, you're enabling a missionary to do the same. And you're having a part in that ministry. And every work that that man does, whether it's teaching the Bible, whether it's soul winning or handing out tracts, preaching, it's added to your account. And when you increase your giving, you're increasing those rewards that you're receiving, and you're laying up treasures in heaven. Paul said in, in Philippians 4.17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. God's reward, God rewards us according to the work, the work that's going on. 1 Corinthians 3.8, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And we need to understand that when we do a work for God, whether, it's, whether somebody gets saved or not immediately, there's a reward in heaven because God, look, God looks at the work. If there's no planting getting done, if there's no work being accomplished, then there's not going to be any fruit. If the, if the farmer doesn't go out into the field, if he doesn't plow, if he just leaves his field there and says, well... Look at that field. It's all grown over with weeds. It's useless. I'll never grow anything in that. I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> Nothing will ever grow in it. But once that farmer takes the work into his hand and he starts going out there, he starts plowing the field, he starts pulling the weeds, he starts ripping the rocks out, putting them to the sides and, 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 and churning the soil, putting fertilizer in and, and planting seeds, eventually he's going to start seeing a harvest in that field. You know, it may take him years. He may never see a harvest himself, but the next person that comes along after he's done all that work, they're going to plant something in there, and that, that ground is going to be ready and fertile for somebody to plant, to plant something in there, and it's gonna, they're going to have a great harvest in that area. You know, I heard somebody say one time, people succeed where others have struggled, and it's true. There was a man I met I was out soul winning, knocking on doors. It was a rainy night, and I, nobody was answering their doors. It was a middle class, upper middle class area. And I knocked on the door, and the man let me in. I sat down on the couch. I started going through the Romans road with him, and he's just agreeing and agreeing with me and agreeing. And I thought to myself, as I'm going through, I thought, this is just too easy. This guy's just blowing me off. He's trying to get me out of his house as fast as he can. And I got through, and he prayed. He prayed right away. <laughs> And, and we sat there. When we got done praying, he looked at me and he said, he said, look, he said, I, he said, he said, I was, he said, I, he said, the reason I invited you in tonight, he said, I, I work for NASCAR and the chaplain of NASCAR, he said, he's been telling me this for, for, for months now. He's been telling me I need to get saved. He said, when you knocked on my door tonight, he, he said, I, I was ready. I was ready and I, I wanted to accept Christ as my savior. And I realized that night, you know, Paul, I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. I got to see the fruit, truly, I got to see the fruit of another man's labors. He didn't get to see that man get saved, but I did. But it wasn't me. It was the work of the gospel. Only this generation can reach this generation. We can read about past revivals. We can look at past generations, but they're not here anymore. It's up to us. Only we can reach the people today. I can only reach the people today. I can't reach the people that have passed away. I can't reach the people that aren't even here yet. But I can reach the people that are around me today. It's our duty. You know, I have a suspicion that if we begin to use our lives for God, that we're going to see some salvation. We're, salvations. We're going to see lives changed. I have a feeling God's going to let us see some fruit for our labors. But you may never see a soul saved. But you'll be rewarded for your labors. And unless there's somebody doing something, unless there's labor being done, unless there's sowing, there's never going to be reaping. Tesco, the, that shop that I was talking about at the beginning, it says that if I spend money at their shop, they're going to give me points for the use, uh, to use for special things. And God's rewards program says that if we use our talents and the abilities and resources that we've been given 
for his glory and to get the gospel to a lost and dying world, he's going to give us rewards in heaven when we get there. And let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Father, we thank you for... Um, Thank you, Lord, for, for you, know, you didn't just send your son to die for us on the cross, but you've entrusted us with that, with that gospel, with, the, with the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the remission of sins to spread to a lost and dying world. And not only that, his death on the cross should be enough to motivate us, but you don't know, just leave it there. You reward us for the work that we do here on earth. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless, that you would, that you would help us to, to realize that we are earning eternal rewards in heaven. And that every work we do, every, every dollar we give, everything that we, we do for your, for your kingdom and for your glory is added to our account. And may we be rich when we enter those gates, when, we've, when, that, when that final day comes in our lives. And we enter those pearly gates and we get to see your son face to face. May he say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I pray, Lord, that you would use the message this morning to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.